Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. Hope you're having a great day as we continue to celebrate Mississippi and all the people who worked so hard to make it such a great place to live, work, and play. Hey, listen, one of the things I enjoy most about this show is the opportunity to talk to a wide range of people, including people in the restaurant industry. And we're going to, when I was over in New Orleans, they did some really cool things as it related to food. Uh, We'll never be able to match that. They've they've got world-class writers there and the restaurant scene and all that. But one of the things that they did is from time to time they'll they'll figure out what's the best fried chicken in the in town and what's the best hamburgers in town and so on and they have a lot of fun with that and we're going to actually do that here at the Ricky Matthews show you may have noticed that at the Ricky Matthews Facebook page we put a note in there to let us know the uh, you know where we, you can get the best fried chicken in coastal Mississippi and uh, I checked this morning and nearly two thousand people have interacted with the, with that post. And lots of great ideas coming out. A lot of places I've never heard from, and I'm not surprised by that. This happens in New Orleans as well. You get, you find out about these little nooks and crannies where you got to take a little drive in the neighborhood, so to speak, and you can find some of the best fried chicken in the world. I think that's what we're going to find here in coastal Mississippi. But you're going to help us get to the top five, and then we're going to we're going to go sample that top five, and we're going to pick one, and we'll have all five of them on the show, and. We'll give them certificates and have a little bit of fun and create some conversation about it. And then more is coming after that. We got we got some more things that we're going to focus on after that. But it's fried chicken for now. So if you've got if you've got an idea, you can go to the Ricky Matthews uh, Show Facebook page or to the Super Talk Gulf Coast Facebook page and uh, weigh in. Let us know where you get the best fried chicken in coastal Mississippi. I look forward to hearing from you, and we'll do that over the next month or two, and then we'll shift gears and go to something else and have a little bit of fun with it. So now let's move over to my friend Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com in the Times-Picayune. We're going to talk Saints, but hey, you know this. Well, first of all, good morning to you, Jeff. Morning, Ricky. Hey, can I partake in that uh, fried chicken contest? It sounds amazing. <laughs> hey, you, hey, but you know this, man. Uh, we, we had a lot of fun with it, and they still do. I think you know y'all may be doing something around that as we speak. But there's some wonderful holes in the wall in New Orleans that have some awesome food, isn't there? Yeah, especially there's some good fried chicken here. Um, and look, I grew up eating fried chicken in Kentucky. My my grandmother made unbelievable fried chicken, seasoned it just right. So I can appreciate it's all about it's all about the frying and it's all about the seasoning for me. And uh, I'm sure we've got some great ones over in your neck of the woods. I'd love to try it sometime. Yeah, I'm super, super looking forward to it. That's that's for sure. OK, so look, Jeff, um, it's uh, game week. <laughs> it's, I know, it's, it's, been a, it's been a long buildup, hasn't it? Yeah, Dennis Allen met us uh, this week. Uh, for our weekly press conference, he goes, I feel like I've talked to you guys like a hundred times <laughs> before since we've, you know, been this off season and I, it does feel long. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of anticipation uh, and build up to this game. And we're going to find out a lot about all the things we've been writing about. You know, Dennis Allen said it's no one really knows. That's the beauty of the opener in the NFL because preseason, everybody's masking what they really do. So you kind of open up your Christmas presents on Christmas morning uh, this Sunday, it's gonna be fun to watch. I love the way he said that. I, I think that was great. That was a great way to talk about it. But look, your headline said, "Amid doubt and uncertainty, a defining season awaits the Saints and Dennis Allen." It could yeah. go either way, could it, my friend? Yeah, I, I use the term, and you can appreciate this because you're a weather nerd. I mean, uh, uh, a, they have a wide cone of uncertainty. <laughs> the Saints do. Like I, I think they could be good and win 11 games and win the division, make a playoff run. And also think the wheels could come off. It's just, there's just a very precarious feel to the team in certain areas. I think they're solidified in certain spots, but man, there's some areas where if things go bad, uh, this thing could, could go South. So we'll see how it works out. I do think it's a big season for Dennis Allen because let's face it, Ricky, two years ago, he cleaned house on the defensive staff. Last year, this past offseason, he cleaned house on the offensive staff. He's got his own quarterback in there, the guy he handpicked to bring in. It's kind of time. There's no more excuses. I mean, he's got his whole new coaching staff and his quarterback in there. They, they've got to win. Hey, listen, uh, it, uh, of course, it's easy to recall these times over the past several years that you and I have been visiting on the show. 
it's normal to have to kind of buy into the ha- hype and feel positive. You've never been one of those guys. You're always going to bring kind of common sense and a sense of, you know, you're not, you don't have the rose colored glasses on, but you do, you do this year f- feel a little different about the team in terms of that wide cone of, of, of uncertainty, because you do believe they could have a really good season, but you also believe that if they don't win in the trenches and a couple of other things don't fall into place, they could have a bad year. Um, last year, let's go back to last year. You, you know, there was a lot of hype surrounding uh, our new, our, at, at the time, our new quarterback. We thought he was going to be a savior. And you said, look, <laughs> I get it. I know why people are so excited you know, I, th- I can understand why people feel the way they do, but at the end of the day, you know, there are a lot of other challenges this this team has, so I'm not buying into the hype. And they had a fairly good season, Jeff. Uh, may- maybe if Carr had not gotten injured in the beginning of the season, things would have turned out slightly different because he really did it, close the season on a positive note. This year it, f- it feels different. And is it just – does it feel different because – you know, ch- addressing the defensive line with Chase Young and some of our injured guys coming back and playing pretty well, and you know having a new offensive scheme. But are we? How how do you compare how we felt last year and how we feel this year in terms of the opportunity to succeed? Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't feel like it is any different. I, I feel like it's very similar. I thought the Saints. I did a pick. I, I changed my my preseason prediction last year. I started out at nine and eight, and then after going through camp, I changed it to eleven and six. I mean, I, I got caught up in it. I, I was kicking myself mid season for for drinking the Kool Aid. Uh, I rarely do that, but I'm telling you, Derek Carr looked great in training camp a year ago. That's why I'm hesitant right now. He looked tremendous a year ago. They were moving the ball effortlessly. If you remember, they only played one preseason series last year, and they went right down the field and scored a touchdown. Everybody was going crazy. So, you know, you you really have to reserve judgment a little bit. Uh, I don't think they've done a lot in the offseason. Yeah, they added Chase Young, uh, but you can question some of that even. And, uh, you know, let's look around the league. I think sometimes my role, Ricky, and it sounds like the wet blanket role is – just to lend perspective around the league, you know, like here's what other teams are doing. We focus so much in the world today on myopically looking at your own team. You got to sometimes pull back and go, well, look what's going on in these other markets. And I think teams have, you know, look at Atlanta, for instance, you know, with, with Kirk cousins and Justin Simmons and all the guys they brought in. So like, it, I just think you can talk yourself into some of this. It's easy to do. And I did that a year ago, but I'm not doing it again. <laughs> you know? Well, one thing is for sure, they're committed to the run game. And they uh, I've, I've watched some podcasts and read a lot. At the end of the day, they're going to have to be super patient because if it doesn't if it doesn't work for them, they have to stay focused because as you've pointed out to us, one of the schemes of this new offense is to really attack the running game on the perimeter and their goal is to spread it out and maybe open up some, some intermediate, maybe even some long passes, but they've got to stay committed to the run game for this offense to work. Don't they? It's the only way they're going to be successful. The only way if they can't run the ball better than they did the last couple of years and a lot better, I think it could be a long season. I mean, that's the whole reason they brought in Clint Kubiak and Rick Dennison, John Benton, to improve the running game. This is how they want to play under Dennis Allen. That's how they want wanted to play in past years. They realize like Derek Carr at this stage, 11 years in, we know what he is. He He's a fine game manager quarterback. He's a mid-level starting quarterback in the NFL. That's fine. You can win that way. I mean, the, the Detroit Lions have Jared Goff at quarterback and they went to the NFC championship game. He's very similar, I think, in talent and skill to Derek Carr. But you've got to be good everywhere else and take the pressure off of Carr so he's not carrying the team the way Drew Brees could because that's not going to be successful. So they've got to be better up front along the line. They've got to be able to run the ball. They do not. This team does not want to be in third and 13. No, they, they don't. Hey, listen, one thing that is clear, though, is you look at sort of what the moves, what moves they're making, what what players they're bringing in to try out, et cetera. When you look at wide receiver – our number two, our top guy and our number two guy are pretty much set in stone. 
Okay, but once you, once you get beyond that, they're not highly confident they've got their number three and number four receiver in, in place. Is that your read on it? Oh, 100%. I mean, that's why they've been bringing all these other receivers in for workouts. Uh, you know, and they shouldn't be. I mean, there's no one that stood out there. Uh, I would argue the third best receiver right now is undrafted rookie Mason Tipton from Yale. Uh, that's where they're at. Uh, but we can get to this on the other side because I don't think it's as big a deal as people are making it out to be. Yeah. It, would be, it will be, though, if there's some injuries. Yeah, there's, I, hear, I hear you on that. Let's, uh, we'll get your thoughts on that as we continue our conversation with NOLA.com and the Time Picayune's Jeff Duncan. See you after this break. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. I have my friend Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picayune. We'll come back to wide receiver in a second, but speaking of hype, Cam Jordan tells Amon Ross St. Brown on his podcast that the Saints have a chance of going to the Super Bowl. Hey, look, that's where I am is until they <laughs> start losing. I, wouldn't it be cool for the Saints to play in the Super Bowl in their home field exa- advantage right there in the Superdome? Yeah, well, here's the thing. I agree with Cam in this regard. If they get in the playoffs, anything's possible. It happens all the time, Ricky. I mean, we saw the Bucks last year were not a very good team. I mean, I went down to Tampa right on Christmas, uh, New Year's Eve and watched the Saints drill the Bucks on their home field. And then a few weeks later, here's Tampa winning a playoff game against Philly and then going to Detroit and playing Detroit down to the wire. It can happen. It does all the time. And this team's got enough talent to do that. Uh, but a lot of things have to fall in place. I think that's – if you read our, our media survey where we surveyed – I surveyed 30 local reporters. Uh, I think everybody had a good beat on the team. They all agree this team can be good. But there's a lot of things that have to go right. And in a given season, traditionally, historically, all those things don't go right for you. But it can happen. It does all the time. Well, coming back to receiver, Chris Olave, I think everyone in the in the league is impressed by Chris Olave and thinks he's going to have a really good season if he can stay healthy. It's always if they can stay healthy. Shahid is a barn burner, and as long as he stays healthy, he's going to be a great number two, and those guys are set. And then a few guys behind them. A.T. Perry didn't emerge the way you wanted him to during during uh, preseason, but maybe he, maybe he starts to take home, but we'll see. But the point you were making before we went to break, as long as Shahid and and Alave stay healthy, you're not as concerned about who the next guy is as you typically typically would be, because you're not going to see a bunch of three and four receiver sets and that kind of stuff, are you? Right. That's that's my point. I mean, this team's going to be a lot of two tight end sets, two running back sets with Taysom and Alvin Kamara on the field together. Juwan, like I think they're five best, most talented skill position players are Olave, Shahid, Taysom Hill, Alvin Kamara, and Jawan Johnson. I think those five are going to be on the field most of the time. So your third receiver isn't going to be as important for this team and this scheme as maybe some other teams. Now, when you get into those obvious passing situations, if you're not successful running the ball first and second down and you are in a third and ten, you're probably going to go to three receivers, and that's where the third receiver does come in. And I do think it's some something they'd like to upgrade, but I don't think it's – dire on this team as it would be some others. Hey, the way you talk about those five good offensive players in those skills positions, one of the things I noted is uh, in most of the conversations, and even even the offensive coordinator alluded to this, Dennis Allen has alluded to this, where, you, where last year you had Carmichael constantly rotating people in and out, constantly. I mean, it's almost confusing. You're not going to see as much rotating in and out this year as you normally see at the skill position. That's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, I agree with that. They're going to play more reps. I mean, if you look at the 49ers, most of their skill position players play heavy reps. Uh, and this, th- th- that was a staple of the Sean Payton offense, constantly rotating in. They were, they were brilliant at it. They were the best in the league at rotating and changing personnel packages. Uh, that was that was something that they used to blitz what they call blitz the defense, bring in different personnel. Defense is trying to match up, creates confusion. So, you know, you've got to be good at it, though. You, you, you know, it can create internal problems if you don't. Uh, so maybe that slippage attention to detail hurt them without Sean Payton riding herd on the offense. 
So I do think it's going to change a little bit. The one thing I'm a little worried about, and this has hit me in the last week or so, everyone's caught up, rightfully so, in the Taysom Hill package and how Taysom Hill is going to be used. I'm a little concerned with more usage, how many times he's exposed. He's had a, a history of not only injuries, especially in college, but with concussions. And this is a violent game, Ricky. We've talked about it. I just worry about him holding up with more touch. I think there's a reason they limited his touches in the past. I don't think it was just a neglect. I think they were trying to manage him and get him through a 16, 17 game season. I should say, Hey, I watched a, I watched a, I had to, I'll send it to you. If I can remember, I saw it on YouTube. It just popped up. It was a, about a 17 minute documentary about Taysom Hill that some sports group did. And, and as much as we did in that, uh, say we, but much as no, that kind of the time speaking, you did recently kind of, track his rehabilitation and what he does and his commitment to working out weights and all that. I mean, he's a freak of an athlete, but it went back to high school and how good a player he was in high school. And then his specific injuries, which were really just bad luck and how they fell into place. And then what happened when he came into the league and, and it spoke specifically of his obsession. His obsession is what helped him get through all that. And his obsession is that he's always trained unbelievably hard. I mean, I mean, like, like, uh, you know, I think you know, as, during his rookie year, uh, squatting 650 pounds and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, of course it, on an older man's body, you can't, you can't be doing that heavier weight. You'll, you'll bust your body up, but, but he is a freak of an athlete, but sometimes you can't guard the kind of hits you're going to take to your head. And this is the point that you're making. I mean, you got to have everything else going well, but one thing you can't train is how accessible you're going to be to uh, to concussions. Of course, maybe the new helmets are helping some. I don't know, but it is a it is a big question mark out there. As long in a scenario where you're putting more reps on on his back, and that's what they plan to do, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's what you know. We all get it caught up in that. I mean, I'm a fantasy football player, so I want my guys to get as many touches as I can, right? But there is a downside to that. I mean, there's, you know, there's a reason people man coaches manage players playing time. I think we're going to see that with Alvin Kamara this year. I think he's going to have less touches in the than he has in the past because they want to get him through the year and get him through the season. And the saints don't have a lot of depth at running back. So I think they'll spread those things out. It might take them a little while to come up with the magic number for those guys, but I don't think it's as simple as, all right, we just need to run Taysom Hill a lot. First of all, every team's going to know that. And second of all, you know, you, you got to keep him healthy and keep him upright or else it's no good if he's on the sidelines. Hey, you and I talked about this on the phone yesterday, but I think it's worth noting. I do spend a lot of time looking at what other markets are saying about the Saints. And, of course, with this upcoming game with Carolina, it was very interesting. I, 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 even I didn't know when we were talking until I checked while we were talking. It was actually the Charlotte Observer. I mean, this is – a legitimate group of sports guys, um, uh, reporters who cover that that team like a blanket, who had z basically zero respect for the Saints. Did you have an opportunity to listen to that? I listened to a little bit of it. I came away with them having less respect for the Saints than them way overhyping the Panthers. You know, I think, and that's that's a good example of what I'm talking about, Ricky. Yeah, the Kool Aid. You know, uh, I'm on the I'm on this side of it here. I mean. You know, you, it's easy when you're sitting there watching your team every day to talk yourself into, hey, we're going to be good. You know, and the, it, it came across that way for the Panthers writers. I mean, I think they are really expecting to be much improved, but sometimes it just comes down to talent in this league. And I don't see it from Carolina. I think the Saints are going to win handily on Sunday. I'll be shocked if it's a close game. Well, I mean, again, they didn't have respect for the Saints secondary, which is probably a, well, not probably it is a strength of the team. So, if they put it in the Bryce Young's hands, and 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 he's got to pass his way out of this, going against our secondary with the, hopefully the pressure our defensive line is going to be putting on them, that turns out better for us than it does for them. Don't you agree? The, the whole I've talked to Tyron Matthew. He's the whole game plan. Everything comes down to very one simple thing: to stop the run and keep him in the pocket. You know, if they keep him in the pocket, he's going to have to beat them with his arm throwing to kind of a fairly mediocre uh, receiving core. And we saw it last year. They did it. They were really good at that last year. He slipped away a few times against them. 
Uh, but otherwise, they were managed to keep him between the tackles. And at 5'11", he's a thin guy. I mean, I remember him being on the field last year in the Superdome and looking at him. And he's as thin as Jaden Daniels is, but he's not 6'3", like Jaden Daniels. He's 5'11". So uh, I think I think he's going to struggle big time with the Saints' physical defense on Sunday. Okay, so who was the uh, quarterback that played at Boston College that played for the Buffalo Bills, the little guy? My mind's blank on his name. Oh, Doug Flutie. Doug Flutie. Okay, so one of the games I went to when I was working for the Sun-Herald for – I lived about a month or two in the, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, and Doug Flutie was on the field, and I was on the field after the – and I was taller than Doug Flutie. I could not believe how little he was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, be interesting to know if a, if a Doug Flutie could play today. <laughs> Cause this, I think this, he could. I mean, Doug Flutie was a, was an exception, though. You know, he was a rare, rare. I mean, I, I think Kyler Murray is very similar to Doug Flutie playing for the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, you know, you have to build your whole scheme around. That's what Carolina's done. They spent a ton of money this offseason following the, the Saints lead with Drew Brees when they built their interior offensive line as the strength of the line with Jari Evans, Carl Nix and that group, that's what they did. They brought in two big time guards and they're going to try and keep the pressure off him. We'll see if it works. It's going to be so much fun to have the game this Sunday and the NFL is underway. And we, uh, Saints, Saints got a, they got the best record in the NFL uh, five, five uh, seasons in a row where they won the first game of the season. They're, they're, Far and away, I think the next are three teams, I think, tied with three games in a row. I didn't realize that. So, so yeah. you know, maybe we can make it six. Well, the Chiefs had eight games until going into last season and then lost to the Lions in their opener. So, Saints are the Kings right now, the openers. How about that? You didn't know that, did you? Okay, God bless you. I'll see you after this break. 